our friend from up north, Mr. Uh, Min Tran. I'm sure many of you already know Min, um, but if I could just share a little bit about him. Min is the uh, creative uh, director for Dental Tech Tips. I'm sure a lot of you follow him on social media. Uh, he's been a dental technician since 2006. And um, Min is, was actually one of the first three shape users in Canada. So uh, he has a tremendous amount of knowledge and, and I think you'll, you'll find him to be very resourceful um, today. He also um, is a member of many study groups um, and the American Prosthodontic Society and serves on a number of committees and, and is also um, on the editorial board for a number of different publications. So I know you're going to bring a wealth of knowledge to us today. Thank you for coming and um, enjoy. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for the, the great introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I want to say thank you to Argon for the invitation to speak, uh, LMT as well for organizing such a wonderful event. Sorry, guys. Uh, hey, Siri. Uh-huh. Uh, can you... I, I just got a text from Dr. Jones. Um, I'm, at Cal I'm in California actually at LMT. Um, can we make some clear aligners and have them delivered? Who do you want to send it to? Uh, Dr. Jones. Affirmative, making a set of clear aligners. Hope your lecture goes well. Oh, thanks. Okay, sorry guys, I had to take care of that rush case. You know, you know how doctors are, they, they always bother you when you're you know, at the most inconvenient times. Um, so thank you again guys for the, the invitation. Um, let me, there we go. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Min Tran, I'm a dental technician based out of Windsor, Ontario. I've been in the industry since 2006 and I spent the majority of that time behind a computer using a mouse and keyboard, primarily by designing on 3Shape. But I've had the privilege of using a wide variety of digital technologies when it comes to the dental lab industry. Um, in my fair, spare time, I run a blog called Dental Tech Tips, uh, where we focus on the latest and greatest in dental technology. So if you want to find me online or via social media, you can find me in all the usual places by liking or searching at Dental Tech Tips. Um, I'm going to take a moment just to speak about Dental Tech Tips as an organization, how it was founded, and really hope, hopefully paint a little bit of a picture of, of, of what, what I do and, and why I do it. So very often you go to trade shows, much like this one, and you know you, you see all these key opinion leaders, speakers, they're well regarded, have all these accolades. But very often, I, I hate to say it, but they're industry mouthpieces. And they're just willing to sell whatever product the, the highest bidder tells them to sell. And it, it's, it never sat right with me because they'd recommend these products. They're very well respected. And you get them back in the lab and you use it, and it's not necessarily as good as they claimed it to be. And it just never sat right with me. Around when, at the time when I founded Dental Tech Tips, actually, I got my first real big camera. And look at this guy, he's so artistic, taking a photo of himself in the mirror, right? And it's one of my passions, right? You just take photos, photography, video, making videos. Um, 
And, and, when I, and you spend a lot of time in the lab as a technician. So the only thing you really have things to take photos of is you know, lab things. So you start making little videos of different products that come across. And I, I made some reviews and you catch the attention of, of some manufacturers. Maybe they think, okay, you know what, let, let me send you some stuff. Try it out for free. You get free stuff, that's, that's awesome. Who doesn't love getting free stuff, right? But really, it's just, just a, it was just an outlet and a, a passion for me to really make these videos. And eventually, you know, I, I got like a sponsored uh, project with one of these companies. And I think maybe it was like a few hundred dollars or something like that. Nothing crazy. But very quickly, I realized the camera I was using wasn't sufficient enough. It didn't have input for audio. The screen wasn't sufficient enough. So I took that money from that first project, sold my camera, and I bought the T5i, which was like the next model up with the tilty flippy screen. And I've always kind of made it a point to, to reinvest a little bit of, from every project that I finished to, to invest in better kind of camera equipment. So really, Dental Tech Tips was founded as a way for me to fund my seriously unhealthy addiction to camera gear. <laughs> and I mean seriously, seriously unhealthy. I have my Renfrit mobile scope, a handpiece, and all these hemostats to disassemble lenses and reseat glass and you know, reseat microchips. Uh, but that's, that's more on the personal side. On the more altruistic side, Dental Tech Tips was founded as a way to really kind of give back to an industry that I've, I've grown up in and has really just given me everything. So as, as a, a source to be kind of an unbiased source of information for technicians across the world that's really not, you know, in anyone's pocket. Um, so, you know, hopefully this kind of paints a little bit of a better picture of Dental Tech Tips, why I do what I do, um, and that, you know, everything I'm speaking about today is based on my own personal experience of what I found to be best. Uh, full disclosure, of course, I have no interest in any of the companies I'm mentioning today. I am, of course, receiving an honorarium from Argon, but they have not even seen my slide deck. I, was, <laughs> I didn't even email to them. So everything I'm saying here is wholly my own. So of course, our topic today is navigating the digital highway. And when you look at the word navigation, you think of the word navigation, you automatically think of GPS or Google Maps. But the history of the word navigation, the root of it is actually Latin and it comes from the word, the, it shares the same root as the word navy. So this here is the cruise ship Trios 3. Funny enough, the last time I gave this presentation back before the world imploded and you know the cruise ship industry was the first thing to kind of go down, that was February 2020. <laughs> so hopefully I don't jinx things again by, by putting this up there. <laughs> but let's, let's get on with our journey anyways. So very often with, with case planning, with, with uh, everything, you know, have a goal, you know, you have a, maybe a, a vague, uh, desired endpoint. With case planning, or even, you know, yesterday I went to go visit a friend out near San Bernardino there, and if to get back here, my point A to point B was going to be anywhere from one hour to two hours, according to Google Maps. If I didn't punch that in, and I just said, you know what, I have dinner with Argon at seven o'clock, oh, we'll get there at some point, and I didn't plan it, you know, things could get really, really messy. So, you know, having a destination punched into Google Maps is very much like planning your cases, right? Um, even if there's traffic, even if there's an accident, even if there's a, a detour or delay, knowing your desired endpoint is very, very important, and it, it will get you back on track much, much easier. So I, I think we are living in what I would say is the best time ever to be a dental technician. Uh, if there's so much transfer, transformation, so much transition, um, but also, we're living in what's kind of like a, a weird time because the job description has, has never been more vague. A dental technician isn't just somebody who focuses on these five disciplines anymore, right? A dental technician, uh, and we'll, we'll speak about kind of all these indications a little bit later, but a dental technician is really, you know, you could, uh, you're a data management expert, a technical advisor, IT aficionado, machine servicer, material science wizard, treatment client coordinator, customer service representative, so, salesman, social media guru, client educator, so on and so forth. I could just sit here all day and just kind of list off all the kind of multifaceted things that we do. But a uh, technician in 1963, when they first introduced the PFM from Vita, they could have started day one, you know, learn how to cast some copings, slap some opaque on top, and then put some porcelain, and they could have worked their entire career, 40 years from the beginning all the way to the end, and just retire just fine. In contrast, when I first started, I started at the bench as a metal worker. I did my first copings about two, three months in on these ugly little zirconia copings in three shape where you only had the dye and you had to add remove. Uh, we'd cover them with porcelain just like we would with the PFM. We saw the rise of Bruxer and kind of monolithic and all those different materials. Emacs being milled, pressed, all this um, 
the introduction of digital scanners, implant components, and of course the advent of 3D printing. And all of this has just happened in a span of less than 15 years, or about a third of the time that you would have you know, been a PFM technician. So, and that's, that's just in, in my career, and things are just constantly changing. I wrote an article actually in DTG Magazine uh, kind of outlining this, and if you want to, you can kind of grab that QR code and you can actually follow it, just snap a picture. But basically, it, it highlights the, the paradigm shift we've experienced in our industry. And this picture here is me having some fun, and including some friends here, some, actually somewhere in, in the crowd today. But it's just, you know, the rise of the digital technician, right? Because very often, when you would go to the lab, right, the most skilled, the, high, the most highly skilled, most sought after technician in the building was, you know, the ceramists. And these guys were these untouchable gods who, you know, um, you, you just couldn't touch. But that position to me, I think, has kind of really transitioned to the digital dental technician. And, and as technicians, we're very used to kind of being not ever involved in the thought process, let alone being involved with planning at all. We're usually, you know, off in some faraway dungeon as a footnote with some scribbles on a script saying, hey, you know what, my impression wasn't that great. Can you, you know, make it work? The shade's going to be A2. With the advent of digital technicians, the digital de dental technicians given the driver's seat front and center, and you're involved in the planning process, using multidisciplinary, multifaceted ways, facially driven methodologies to really drive these case outcomes. So very much like punching in a destination in Google Maps, you're given the driver's seat to really kind of figure out how these cases are gonna go. So over the next decade, the way that we're gonna be doing digital dentistry, high-end dentistry, it's not just gonna be you know pretty looking six anteriors that are built up in 23 different colors, highly, uh, aesthetic, highly advanced digital dentistry is gonna be driven by highly competent and skilled digital, fully digital dental technicians. And where do we start? I, I speak about this a lot in some of my other talks and these are kind of the phases of, of digital manufacturing, but we always start kind of in the, di the diagnostic pre-planning and communication phase. This is where you kind of lay out your roadmap. And this is kind of your first uh, roadmap here and we start with a, a simple smile design. And the reason we start with that is a smile design is just a very arbitrary, easy way to determine something. So I don't know how many of you have, have done this, but you know, you do a full mouth and you deliver it and it goes in the patient's mouth and the doctor picks up the phone and he goes, we delivered it, everything fit, was great, but the patient just didn't like how sharp these corners were. Can we, you know, round them off or shorten them a little bit? Because you didn't sign, they didn't sign off on something. Something was missed somewhere, right? So then you're going back, you're cutting things back, adding things, and it's not quite ideal. Right, with a smile design, something as simple as this, you snap you know, two pictures and then you present it to the patient. I can make five, six, seven different designs. I can make rounded shapes, triangular shapes, toilet bowl white, you know, chocolate brown, whatever shade they want, whatever shape they want. And you present to the patient. You can't tell them, okay, well, you're functioning, you know, you're going into protrusive and it's causing excess wear. What they see is, oh, well, this is what my tooth should look like and this is how much is deficient, right? So this is what your end goal could look like this is where you're at now. This visual aid, we're very visual people. You see this and you go, okay, I want this. And it really does help to increase your, your, your case acceptance rates. So with this, I mean, you present this to the patient, you have, even so the doctor signs off and says, patient chose this round one shade A2, they didn't think toilet bowl white looked good on them, good. So then of course, sometimes if the doctor thinks that the patient's really good, they'll pair the diagnostic with the smile design. But if you know, they're just dipping their feet and, uh, and just trying to see if they, they want anything, we might do the, the smile design separate from the diagnostic after the, the first consult. So I hate the word wax up. We're not using any wax, I'm a stickler for terminology. So it, what I like to call them are digital diagnostics or digital mock-ups, whatever you may want to call them. But you're using built-in smile libraries and whatever software you may be using. Me, I, I always like to say I'm a very average technician with my hands, and the ability to use these digital smile libraries, they've, they've really boosted me and, and, and kind of made me leap a little bit further ahead than where I may have been in my own career at this point, right? So you can create all these different mock-ups. You can do five different diagnostics, triangular shape, rectangular shape, whatever you want. Could you imagine sitting at the bench, waxing things up, five diagnostics by hand and delivering them? Absolutely not, it's, it's absolutely insane. But I could do this with very, it's not, I'm not gonna say it's super, super easy, but with very little effort. And then you deliver these to the doctor. And if you guys wanna see more about how we take these diagnostics and you know, kind of copy and paste these into subsequent steps tomorrow morning at this time, I'm gonna be speaking for Oregon again about how we copy and paste to really simplify these, yes?
Absolutely. So the, the big thing here is communication, right? So it's, it's increasing communication between you and the clinic and really relationship building, right? Because I, I find a lot of times that, you know, a technician is down here and the doctor's up here. You really need to find clients, well, and I hate to say this, but clients that respect you, right? And, and, and building those relationships and really communicating, hey, we can, and using an example, communicating after a case, you know what, this one went wrong because we missed this step. Right? Just saying, hey, if we start doing more smile designs, if we start doing more diagnostics, we get the patient to sign off. And really just communicating to them, hey, you know what, this is what we need to do to make sure we get this outcome next time. Right? So going back, reassessing, reevaluating, that's really how you, you, you get to, to getting your clients to change things. And sometimes you're not, you're not going to change everybody's mind. Right? People are kind of set in their ways. It's, it's not, but you, you try to find those clients that, that you kind of work with and, and, and work well. well Absolutely. Twenty. Twenty percent, yep. Yeah. So yeah, uh, of course we take this and uh, we'll, we'll speak about it a lot more, how, how to use some really complex workflows and simplify them down by, you, by starting off at this point. So I won't speak too much about that, and if you want to, you can see that tomorrow. But really, when, when you get them to sign off, like I said, you can really help them out a lot by doing these guided solutions, right? And something as simple as making a silicone matrix for them to use in a mock-up, that's a guided solution. So. The reason is because it's prosthetic driven. It's you know, facially driven. It's from the top down rather than the bottom up. Right? You're not trying to make these things match the margin that may be staggered. Or, and it, it gives you better aesthetic outcomes. It gives you more predictable outcomes. So this patient here, you know, she presented. Her chief complaint, of course, is I don't like how gummy my smile is. Very straightforward. So we address this. We, we take some pictures. We do a smile design. I bring it into the diagnostic. I tell the doctor, you know what? I'm going to do my diagnostic. And I'm going to look here and say, you know what? Looking at this picture here, we thought maybe if I didn't have anything else, I could just lop off all of it and we're going to do, you know, crown lengthening everywhere. But I brought it in the software, I lined it up with her face, and I said, you know what, we only really need actually on the two centrals and the laterals. The canines we could do just like a sub-G prep just to push it a little bit and we'll get a pretty good result. So she presents this to the patient and they go, okay, I think that's good. And this is my diagnostic here. We send it to the doctor and she said, yeah, that, that's a pretty good endpoint there. So then what I do is I take this and I just lop off the, the top two thirds right above the height of contour because it gives me a very nice stop and I kind of carve the tissue a little bit, create a clear Essex suck down, just, just something simple. I used, you can do this in custom tray. I don't like it just because it's a little bit convoluted. This, you just do it, zip it, zip everything out, and it's super quick. Right? I'm a huge advocate of doing as many things digitally as possible. But if something traditional works, do it that way. Because if it's just efficient, then efficiency is what matters, not doing digital for the sake of doing digital. So she puts it in, the patient had some reaction uh, to the freezing, so she was, the tissues are really blanched, but she pushed them up there and just actually marked it with a marker, and then she freehanded the rest with a laser. So now you can see here, uh, we did, so what we do now is we, after she had healed up, we did some 3D printed prep guides. So I take my diagnostic back in, I use the splint module in 3Shape, and I just make these prep guides by cutting all these different windows or all these different designs, and they snap into place, so she preps them. So this is my design again. I copied from the beginning, put it back in the other one, and this is the end result here. Right? So you can see how close we were to the final product. And you can really appreciate, you know, we addressed her chief concern here. And this is a guided solution, right? We use guided preps and, and some perio guides. Another one, of course, very huge, and you think of it immediately, is guided surgery, right? Again, prosthetically driven, top down versus bottom up, and you get much better aesthetic outcomes. So this case here, we, uh, the doctor used a dual reference uh, protocol where he scans the CBCT, and I made him a clear radiographic um, duplicate with some markers in there, and we brought it into the, the software. And the nice thing is, if you look here, if I move this a couple degrees this way, you, you have insufficient bone on the buckle there. If I move it 
a couple degrees this way and I rotate all the way around, I can see that, you know what, I'm fully encased in the kind of the densest area of the bone. And we're able to visualize, you know, this is where I can go. I pick up the phone, I call the doctor, he looks at, I had this initially planned as an all on six. He goes, she has a very small opening. There's no way I'm gonna get those, those back implants there. So can we get more AP spread on these? And then, you know, just take out the back, uh, the back six. Um, so we did an all on four instead. And now you can visualize where these are gonna kind of come out of our imported denture as well. But what's really nice is you can also start to calculate your angulation on your multi-units, right? So we can tip it palatally so it's not interfering with incisal edges, it's not in the occlusal space. And you're able to take all this, bring it into a software like 3Shape, but uh, you can generate your surgical guides, put all those things in. But the really nice thing is it's something like this, right? We took that initial design, brought it back in, those access channels, I punched them out in 3Shape, zipped out this little thing on the pallet. So when he seats it, it sits on the pallet fully it picks up all the temporary cylinders, takes it out, and you can just open it up, and she has a very nice open pallet for, for better comfort. The other thing that's really nice is, don't call the police on me, but um, this one here is a printed Flexera base on my Asiga with some GC CNB MFH because that's kind of the only bleach shade uh, printed resin that we have. But I did this as uh, just a quick backup, right? And this, you know, costs you a few dollars. It's, I'm not gonna say it's cheap, cheap, but you know, it, it doesn't cost you very much. You've already done the design. You're just doing this again because if you can get primary stability the day of, you can at least give the patient an immediate they can wear. So. Yeah, now we have the, that one there, and this is kind of our whole package that we sent to the doctor. He actually did the surgery yesterday, so I actually haven't found out how things went, so I'll, I'll, I'll call him today, probably. Um, yeah, so this is kind of your, your roadmap for, for what this diagnostic pre-planning phase kind of looks like, right? You, get, you have your clinical assessment, you kind of address, address some of those chief concerns, photos, do a small design, they do the consult, they do an intro scan, maybe every, all that first one is, is kind of put together, you can press it in one step and then you just kind of go through until you deliver something to them. For Crown and Bridge, uh, the, this is kind of the most mature digital workflow just because we've had it for, for so long. Uh, and this is kind of what a roadmap for, for Crown and Bridge uh, looks like. So you have all these um, different forms of data that need to get fed into the CAD software. We'll speak a little bit more about manufacturing pathways a little bit later, but really you need to find a way to get all this data in, right? And in the lab, the most kind of mature way uh, that we've, we've had for a very long time is, is desktop 3D scanners, right? And but what I've noticed in recent years is with the uh, intraoral scanners being introduced, we are getting less and less conventional impressions. We're probably, you know, 60, 70% digital impressions versus, you know, 30 to 40 um, conventional. So this was kind of your first uh, way to get di things digitized, but I see this trend becoming more and more, um, you know, less. So we actually had probably three doctors in the last week get new scanners. So I always feel like we're gonna have a desktop scanner in the lab because you still need to scan things in. Maybe you duplicated something. There's, there's always gonna be a, one in the lab, but it might just sit in the corner and be used occasionally, not as, you know, and, uh, as, as much as we had for you know, the last two decades. And really with digital impression scanners, I'm not gonna get into too much detail, but when it comes down to it, you know, the more expensive one is probably better than the cheaper one. So make sure you communicate to your clients um, which ones that, that you're able to work with, right? Um, that, that you think are best or that, that. And on our next step on our tour here, ladies and gentlemen, you see the uh, dental technician in its natural habitat uh, checking in cases from all the various portals. So if, if you're anything like me, I'm sure you feel this pain. There's all these different kinds of portals up in, in the cloud that, that organize all this data. And it's, it's just a huge bottleneck. So for, for us, what we did was we, we hired one person just to take care of that. But the, the nice thing is if, if most scanners will output an STL or a PLY file, which is kind of the de facto standard. So if they can at least do that, then you'll be able to you know, work with, with these. So again, Crown and Bridge, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You, know, you get the stuff in, you design it. It kind of forks here, but again, we'll speak about the, the manufacturing pathways a little bit later. And then you just center, press, cast, and it kind of forks there. Right? You can center zirconia, you can center powdered metal, you can press um, Emacs, you can cast, you can print and press, you can mill Emacs. So there's a couple different pathways, and then they kind of converge again where you fit, finish. And nowadays with ceramics, it's kind of moving more towards monolithic where you're just doing more glazing rather than layering a lot of stuff and then you go out for delivery. So this is kind of your roadmap here. And yeah, again, we'll speak about how these, these manufacturing pathways are and a little bit later in the presentation, but this case here, I just wanted to present here, this is Jenny. I did it with uh, Dr. Effie Habshop in Toronto, Ontario, Prosthodontist. And she presented with you know, a lot of wear on the lowers there. So we did, again, a diagnostic with the guides and everything, like um, a matrix so she could mock it up. And we um, delivered all this. The, 
doctor puts it in the mouth, and you can very immediately see the, the difference, even in confidence, everything like that, right? And she, right away, she's like, okay, I want this, let's do that. So we go ahead, and I, I open her up arbitrarily, and I make a diagnostic um, uh, snap-on smile just to hold her open. We we're going to do some perio guides, a whole bunch of other stuff in here. Uh, let me scrub through this video real quick. And we're, we're really, again, just copying and pasting from one step to another until, you know, you kind of reach your, your end point here. And in the software, again, like Crown and Bridge software, it's very fully featured, it's very mature. You're able to take her pictures, overlay it, and then you're able to see what your final design looks like, make sure everything matches up and works really well. And this is kind of the final result here, and then this is what she looks like. So she was very happy with the results. Again, super predictable as long as you, you kind of plan things out and, and follow what, what you've laid out for yourself. Dentures follows very much the same kind of pathway as Crown and Bridge, uh, digital dentures specifically. You get all this data in again, and then we're gonna speak about the manufacturing pathways. But, but with dentures, uh, what, what I find is, you know, it, when you're doing these things traditionally, it was very, you know, long and convoluted. Your first impression, you haven't even started yet. You have your try-in, your second try-in, you have your third try-in. It's all these different washes and resets and all this time in between. And if you're anything like me, I have a couple clients who believe that every single one has a reline after they deliver it, right? Which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, this example I'm gonna show here, I would not recommend you going out tomorrow and telling your doctors, yes, we can do single appointment dentures. But I really wanna highlight uh, some of the, the techniques and, and things that kind of go into to making this kind of more of a possibility. And I really do apologize about this video. It was literally filmed on a potato. And as a person who loves cameras, it, it really pains me. But I think the results uh, kind of speak for themselves. So. Hey, morning. Hey, Min uh, Tanner here. Just wanted to show you the, uh, the denture that we did for Alice Mayerhofer here. Uh, we scanned this one a couple weeks ago. Uh, and then I just took a bite with some... Uh, um, some base plate wax, uh, but here's the fit. You wouldn't think that it would uh, be very retentive uh, just with the short borders, but check this out. Okay, let's see, Alice. I'm just going to seat it again here. And I'm just going to fire it in there. And as soon as it goes in, it's, uh, you can open there. It is in there tight, which is pretty crazy. So just wanted to say thanks for, thanks for a good denture there. Again, I apologize for the video quality. The assistant had it on, you know, iPhone zero mode. Um, so yeah, of course, a, a lot of this comes down to the skill of the, the clinician who's using it. 3Shape has, of course, a, a, a protocol for scanning these dentures, but the, the person scanning these things really has to know how to, you know, displace all these tissues and scan this following that, that protocol. But he, he sends it to me, and, and uh, I, I get this, and um, it's literally a sheet of folded up base plate wax, and those are the teeth I had to work with. And he goes, can you please you know, make this to finish? So I pick up the phone and I go, hey, uh, are you sure? I can send you a, he, so Dr. Dobson there, I live in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. He lives in British Columbia, which is on the other side near the Pacific Ocean. Um, usually what I do on these types of cases is I will design it, I'll send it to him, he'll do a monoblock try-in, and he'll try it in the patient, and, we'll, and then we'll kind of adjust from there. But this patient, she's 93 years old, her son, li and he, he lives in this little tiny village. She's the only dentist for like the next, you know, 500 miles, any which way. So getting her in was quite a challenge. And obviously there's a lot of very, very short borders, but he said, you know what? He's a very technical guy. He's, he's able to do all these things by himself. So he says, don't worry about it. I can reline it myself, if anything. Let's just get this delivered to the patient so she has, has something. So, of course, I go in there, and I'm looking at this. It's got really short borders, and I'm like, well, you know, we're probably not going to get that much retention. And, and the wisdom is, uh, with digital, you don't really need to carve a post dam in these things because you, the only reason you were doing that was because you were trying to account for polymerization shrinkage. So, in here, you can look at this, this scan, and usually what you do is you kind of look for the palatine fovea and, in, in, you know, carve this butterfly post dam in there arbitrarily and you don't really know where you're at. Or if you're lucky, you had a doctor who would actually border mold and mark it with a permanent marker. But with this, I'm able to see that clear demarcation between hard and soft palate. So what I do, of course, is I take this and I just draw it in following exactly where you see on that color scan. And 
we designed the denture on top and you saw kind of the results of how much suction we got there just to kind of account for those, those short peripheral borders. So again, this is kind of what that traditional workflow, you know, from try in number one, try in number two, third try and maybe a ring line at the end. It's, it's, and you have to imagine like, even the best denture technicians, setting up teeth and waxing things up, you're 40 minutes to an hour for one single setup, right? And if you have to go back to do it and the, the second try and doesn't go well, you have to tear apart all these teeth, put them all back together, that's another 40 minutes an hour. With digital, if I'm doing a reset, I'm maybe tweaking a couple things. It's six minutes and three of them are just waiting for things to generate inside a three shape. So rather than this, and I, again, I don't recommend going to your dentist and saying, hey, we're gonna do single appointment dentures and introduce all this chaos in your life. Don't do that. But this is you know, something that is possible with the advent of digital. I'd, I'd actually recommend kind of a workflow of like a, a two-ish appointment. So like maybe two, maybe three, maybe there's a wash in between, right? But with digital, this is a very, this is a very common workflow of what we're going through for doing our digital dentures. Removable partial dentures, I'm not gonna go too much detail, but it, it follows a lot of the same thing. Um, you have 3D printing that helps to augment a lot of things. Same thing, a lot of time savings, a lot of you know, more efficient workflow, a lot less waste. And again, it kind of follows that, that same pathway. You have a, a couple different metal free options. You can send it out for SLM. You can, you can mill it in-house. In you can do injectables. So the, there's, there's a couple different ways to kind of process all this stuff, but it really follows all the, the kind, same kind of things I was speaking about with dentures. Uh, the final frontier of, of digital dentistry for me is, is really orthodontics, right? Like this is kind of like the last, last area that we're kind of focusing on. Uh, but it, ironically, it's funny because a lot of the pioneering when it comes to digital dentistry actually is owed to one company, uh, and especially in 3D printing, and that's Invisalign. So back in the day, Invisalign, when they first started, they have traditional models. They'd segment the teeth a little bit, move the tooth, duplicate the model, and then move the tooth again, duplicate the model, and they go on and on and on and on. And a typical uh, comprehensive orthodontic treatment is typically 40 models per patient. So you could just imagine the scope and scale of how many models you have to do by hand. The only reason that this is possible to do it on the scale that Invisalign does is because of 3D printing. Uh, technologies like in, uh, injecting, stamping, all these, these are mass produced devices, right? But these are all things that are the same. 3D printing is very good at what we call mass customization, right? So you have a whole bunch of patients, every single thing is a little bit different, but you're able to scale these things because of 3D printing. I'm not competing with Invisalign. Um, on average, every single day, they're producing anywhere up to 400,000 models per day. And that's the biggest single producer of 3D printed parts, just general parts, not just in dental, but parts in the world. And that's, that's just for clear aligners. For us, we use clear aligner is a little bit different. Like in that video you saw in the beginning there with that, all that automation. If you've tried making clear aligners by hand, it is an awful experience. We have some people in our lab that, that do that and they have acrylic dust everywhere trying to get that scalloping. You're not gonna compete with Invisalign. But what you're able to do is you're able to use something like this case here that I'm gonna show you. So this patient here, she shows up and she's a young girl, right? And you look at it and you go, well, there's nothing really wrong with her. Everything's in line, inclusion looks fine. So I pick up the phone, I call a doctor, and he says, yeah, I sent you a scan as well. The only concern she has is the erosion kind of on these anterior teeth here. Everything else is fine. If you look at her lowers, occlusion's fine. Everything is great. But she's got sensitivity. Like, we got to do something to protect this. So um, what do we do? So I'm, you know, in my mind, I'm looking at it, I go, just phone it in, do six full coverage crowns, and just be, be done with it. But Dr. Warren Friedel, who did this case, he's a very good friend of mine. He likes to challenge me, right? He goes, listen, she's a young girl. Do you really, would you do 20, to do crowns on, on your wife? Of course not, right? So he goes, come on, let's, let's do something a little bit more minimally invasive, a little bit more fun for her, j just, just to make sure she has the best possible outcome. So you look at the scan here, and again, occlusion is fine, what do you do? Like, you don't wanna do a full mouth opener up and have him do composites and open everything up. That's, that's a lot of work, and even for him to do a chair side if it made him like a, a matrix or anything, managing those contacts and everything is gonna be very, very difficult. So of course, light bulb moment, you, th you tell them, hey, you know what, what if we take clear aligners, right, and we do some interproximal reduction on these lower anteriors, crank them back a little bit so we get some prosthetic space to do a little bit of lingual veneers there. And so what I do is I, I send it off to uh, Full Contour here, they did the, the design plan and we sent it to him and they tell us where they're gonna do IPR and it's just five stages, so this is like two months, nothing, nothing crazy, but you know, we crank it back and he does some interproximal reduction enough to, to get her to the point where we need to uh, do some lingual veneers.
I, my initial inclination was, hey, you know what, I'm gonna do something and just do chair-side bonding. But he's like, oh, I don't wanna manage the contacts. So what we d opted for actually was for some milled um, Vita and Namic instead, and this is the case here. Inserting it here, he's just kind of cleaning things up, making sure he isolates everything in between. And this is kind of the result here. We did lengthen it ever so slightly. She said, no, oh, I'd like it a little bit longer. But you know, it, it's really no different than what she initially presented with. But of course, we're protecting that, that, um, that area from sensitivity. She's, we're, we're, we also kind of need to manage expectations with her. She's not gonna have this forever. It's, it, it, she will probably need crowns later on in life. But at least it's something to kind of hold her over for a little bit. And in a very minimally invasive way, right? And this is kind of the, the end result here. And sometimes when you do things right, people are sh aren't sure you, got, you did anything at all, right? So, so implants, uh, this is kind of the last indication I'm gonna speak to you about. Again, very much the same. You can add photogrammetry in here, a couple, a couple other technologies to kind of really feed that in. But what I wanna to speak to you about here in terms of implants is we have over 150 implant companies in the world. And there's so many different workflows, right? Implant company A has you know, their own workflow, their own nomenclature, their own parts, all this. Um, and you have to stock these parts. You have to have their catalog. Your staff has to know how to order this stuff. Implant company B has these parts and they have these things and it's a completely different nomenclature, different catalog. They have, and you have to know this workflow. Implant company C, maybe you know, they don't even allow you the privilege of milling your own stuff. You have to send it for centralized milling and you have to pay a premium for that. Uh, what I, so how do you, you know, make all this work? You don't want, you know, 150 different catalogs and different things to order. What I always recommend is working with companies that embrace this multi-platform or third party or generic model, right? Companies like Ar Argon IS, um, Elos, Des, Medentica. They are, so the analogy I always use is if you go to the pharmacy, right, and the doctor writes your prescription, do they give you Advil or do they give you ibuprofen? Right? They give you typically the, the generic one because it just, number one, because it saves you money, but because it's just as good as, as the, the name brand, right? So these implant companies, what they do in order to meet these regulatory um, bodies is they have to make sure and prove that their parts are at least one-to-one, -one, if not exceeding what that implant company manufacturer is doing. They also need to make sure that their warranties are at least meeting or exceeding what these implant companies are doing. So in order to kind of streamline these things and really, really make your life a little bit simpler, you know, with a company like this, you can do angled screw channels. You know, you can, if you need to, you can change the gingival heights mid-design, right? Where some of these OEMs, they don't have these options. They don't have very many good prosthetic options. So if I need to do, you know, a, a screw mentable crown because I need a custom abutment, I can change that on the fly a little bit easier than some of these OEMs. So, you know, and with implants, you have tie bases, which is really popular. You can do prefab custom abutments uh, if you're able to mill titanium. Uh, FDA is a little bit weird over here, but in Canada, in the Wild West up in Canada, we're able to mill our own, our own metal and everything like that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's nice because you can, there's a lot of different options to really have great treatments for implants. So let's, let's speak a little bit about manufacturing. Um, now, you can really kind of split it down in, into two things, right? You have additive and, and reductive technologies, right? So reductive, of course, is something like milling, right? Milling is very mature. It's the most reliable way to produce almost, you know, 90% of all the stuff that we do today um, just because we've been using it for so long. Milling zirconia, milling PMMA, things like that. The problem is there's, you're very limited by tool geometry, right? So if you have undercuts or anything like that, you're limited by how that machine can move. And of course, it's, it's, there's a lot of waste, reductive, there's a lot of things that you have the, the, that they're just time consuming. Milling dentures is, is something that's, I've always thought was kind of a dumb business model, but you know, it, it, it does make sense if, if you're using it just to complement your crown and bridge or if you're a denturist. So this is me back in 2006, and this was the machine that we had. And uh, I remember back then, when you'd go to a trade show, everybody had their own milling machine. They had their zirconia disks, and you have to use RFID readers to make sure that it was within that system. But over time, what you, what you find now is you can go out there and you can get any one of these milling machines and any one of these you know, brands of zirconia, and you can put them into any one of these machines. Because we as consumers and kind of the end users of these things have dictated that this is the standard that we wanted, right? So rather than that, that closed philosophy. So very much like milling, printing is, is kind of, f it's funny to see that same kind of parallel. You'll go to the, boot, the show floor today and you'll see everyone kind of has their own printer and they have their own kind of resins and everything like that and uh, they're locked and you have RFID readers. 
And back when I did, did this uh, presentation a few years ago, you can see all these different kind of technologies that we had, all these different philosophies, all these different, but nowadays I've kind of updated this, this handy little chart here to what I think is, is, is the best kind of printers in, uh, available to us today. And you can kind of see, again, that, that kind of convergence, right, to, towards open, where before, you know, closed, 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 semi-open, and you only had one open option, where these are semi-open, and then, you know, you only have a few closed ones. Again, all these technologies have kind of converged onto DLP as kind of the de facto standard, right? You had SLA, FDM, PolyJet, all these different things. We've kind of really converged on uh, DLP as the technology. And also, you can look at the, the varying accuracy of all these different printers, right? You can see that a sub 50 micron accuracy is really where we're kind of converging to today. It, it does need to get better if we're really going to get, but that, that'll come with, you know, uh, technical advancements and better materials. But really, this, this, this chart here kind of illustrates how, how things are, kind of printers you want to look out for and the technologies that you want to work with. So um, if you're trying to purchase a printer, though, how, how, do you, how do you do that, right? Because, like I said, this one here, you know, you have all these different price points, you have all these different technologies. They're, they're, they're close, but they're not exactly the same. How do you, you know, get a more apples to apples comparison, right? What I like to do is I like to check the price per square millimeter. So very much like when you're checking real estate, uh, you know, price per square foot, you want to make sure that each printer, and it, it's not really an indication of, like, how good the printer is. Like, you know, the Form Labs 2 I'm not a big fan of, but, you know, it has a very small price per square millimeter. So if you want to compare printers and you, you like certain features, but you narrow it down to three, just look at the, the, the price per square millimeter at least to, to give you a, a better idea of if you're getting a good value out of it. And if you really want to kind of dive into, you know, figuring out the ROI of getting a printer, the ROI on certain indications, print indications, things like that, take a picture of this QR code here. I did a webinar on the ROI of 3D printing, and you can really kind of look into um, get much more into details. About, we spent about an hour just kind of going through each, each one of these things. So, yeah, just snap a picture of that there. And again, if, if you want to um, see where, I did one with Evident as well, where we compared a $100 printer versus, you know, our $100,000 printers and, and kind of the benefits at all those different price points. There's good printers at $100. There's good printers at $100,000, but it's not for everybody, right? We all have different business models. We all have different uh, needs. So that there's, there's good printers at, at, at every price point. Hit, get that QR code. You can watch that, that one as well. So some, yes. I have not, I have not yet, no. Okay. So if Hey Gears is watching or listening, send me one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, some outcomes and, and predictions. Uh, so, you know, with digital, everything has, has been really augmented, right? But even our, our support and, and the way that, that we work with each other has been, you know, really democratized and digitized, right? I'm part of, you know, like a thousand Facebook groups on my uh, phone there. And some of them are, you know, 30,000 members and you get instantaneous support 24 seven. Where back in the day, you were kind of like, a lone person in, in your lab, and if you had, to, you'd have to call your reseller, and they'd escalate to maybe the the main company that was in Germany, and you'd have to get in at 3 a.m. to catch them, right? So like, every, and we're not the best at everything. Nobody's the best at everything. Maybe you're really good at you know ceramics, but you're not so good at dentures. Being kind of like a a lone operator, you're kind of left to figuring these things out. Maybe you go to Chicago, maybe you go to Lab Day West or, you know, Cologne or something like that, and you, you meet up with a few colleagues, you get a drink, you learn one or two tricks, but you're really, like, left to your own devices. The way that we're able to do things now, much like Dr. Dobson, who lives in BC, he has a printer. I can send him something, I can, and he can print it there and do something for the patient. And for example, if my mill goes down and I can't do something, I can call my friend and say, hey, can I send you this? Can you mill it, center it, and send it back to me? So we're able to really like decentralize a lot of this stuff, and it really allows kind of the best technologies and the, the best of us to trickle to the top. And every day is really online, is, is really like going to one of these trade shows. So you're able to learn so much more and accelerate your learning so much more. And, and I'm not a huge proponent of saying, you know what, you should buy this technology or buy this printer or whatever because it's digital and it's better and it'll save you more time and, you know, you can make more money and get more case pans. Is that a real benefit? Of course it is. But I'm, I'm more of a proponent of, yes, we can do these things because it makes better work. It gives us better work balance, right? There's very often times where, you know, you don't, just don't have enough hands at the lab and, and you just need to, you know, spend your evenings, your weekends, whatever time to kind of catch things up. But, but that's not what I'm about. I'm, I'm more about, you know, making sure that digital makes things better, right? So when you start doing these things, right, very much with everything, practice makes perfect. When you, you know, set up your first denture, it's awful. But eventually, you get a little bit better, a little bit better. 
So some predictions, things that you should really look out for, you know, a, a lot of additive technologies. Printed permanent crown resins are, are they're investing heavily in that. Printed zirconia is very much in its infancy, but I, I do see that, that developing. Desktop SLM, so little tiny units that you're able to, you know, sinter metal in, in the lab and it's becoming affordable. Jetting technology is very exciting because you have multiple colors, right? So if you want polychromatic restorations, if you want denture bases that are fused monoblock with, with uh, denture teeth, jetting technology is kind of the, the way forward with, with that. So really keep an eye on additive. I really think that's kind of the way of the future and, and, and how that, that's, um, the industry is going to be moving. A couple other things, of course, uh, in that video I showed you in the beginning, uh, increased adoption of uh, intraoral scanners and less desktop scanners. Like I said, we'll always have a desktop scanner in the lab. Uh, you're going to see a lot more automation, a lot more decentralization. All these things will go up in the cloud. I can send them to printers and doctor's offices. I can have these things milled. Our friend Bobby, who lives in South Africa, he's an amazing designer, OutCAD. And yeah, you can just send it to him, go to bed, wake up, and they have these amazing designs. It's, it's absolutely amazing what technology allows us to do. Again, all these additive technologies. And this one here, 4D printing. I know I just said that 3D printing was very much in its infancy, but um, we're already moving on to 4D printing. This technology here from Rodo Health is not actually 4D technology. What 4D is is you're printing a, a certain geometry, and then when you apply a certain force or temperature or something to it, it changes in dimension, right? So what the Roto uh, medical implant components do is they use nitinol, which is the same stuff it used for ortho wires, and it has a memory effect. So if you apply heat or cold to it, it changes shape. So the smile clip, what it does is when it's caught, it's engaged, and when it's cold, it gets disengaged. So that's really interesting. But why is that interesting to us? So very much like uh, Alice there, the 93-year-old patient, they have very terrible dexterity and the ability to remove these you know, locators or whatever, whatnot. And very often you'll go to nursing homes and you'll see like the, uh, the PSWs there are using knives or butter knives to kind of crank these things out. And even on the lowest retention, you can't really get these things out. What the Roto Smell Clip does is it has these little retentive elements. So at body temperature, it's fully open. And you still can take it out and it has the retention very much of like a locator. But when you get, grab a glass of ice water and you have the patient swish it around in their mouth, those clips close up and then they can just take it out really easily. So this is a huge thing for, especially for elderly patients, things like that. So this, and they've, they've launched in the US and they're the, it's, it's very exciting technology for sure. So in conclusion, I, I'd, I'd like to kind of leave you guys with, with a very, very quick story. Yeah, we've got enough time there. Um, like I was saying, open materials, um, the ability to play, uh, these things I think are, are very important, right? The, one of the biggest things for my career has been the ability to, to play with all these, these, these different technologies, right? And, and where do we find time to, to do that? Where do we find time? We're always busy, we always got case plans, we got different things, right? So how do we create this kind of space in our lives to really introduce play into our work? And companies like Google, um, in, in uh, 3M, they have innovation time, they call it also 20% time. Uh, Gmail account, who has a Gmail account? Okay, and that was uh, made in 20% time, right? So the employees there are able to play with projects and whatever that they may have a passion about. And, and, and really, it, it, it's, it's a way to help innovate and keep these companies innovative, of course, but also it, it's, it's kind of a, a big thing for, for really sharing and having a collaborative uh, uh, philosophy when approaching a lot of these things. In our industry, I think we really disproportionately value, you know, keeping secrets and holding on to things and having a competitive advantage. But I think there's a, a huge case for, for being, you know, collaborative and working with each other. So I'm just going to leave you with a, with a story that I kind of really sums everything up here. So it's October 1957 and Sputnik just launched from the Soviet Union. And we're at the Applied Physics Lab at the Johns Hopkins University. And there's these 20-something uh, researchers, um, William, William Geyer and George Wiffenbach. And they're just researchers at the, the APL there. And the news is, oh, there's this man-made object floating in space. It's amazing. And these guys, you know, they're nerding out. Uh, they, they happen to, this is kind of their area of expertise, like radio waves and things like that. So Wiffenbach, in his office, has an antenna and uh, a receiver, so he, they go, you know what, let's go back there and, and see if we can find the this, this signal from, from Sputnik, right? So let's, they, they start searching and they're listening in, in their office and they hear, and it's in this like wide 20 megahertz band and it's bloop, 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 and eventually they find it, right? So they're sitting there and they're listening to it and all these other people in the applied physics lab at, at Johns Hopkins, they come in, they go, what are you doing there? And they go, well, we're listening for Sputnik actually. Do you hear that, that beep? That's Sputnik. 
So they're following it, and then somebody says, you know what, I'm, I'm noticing a little bit of a pattern here. Um, you know what, maybe, maybe we should re record this. Like, this is historic stuff. We're probably the first people in the United States to ever hear this kind of stuff. So somebody pulls out this analog tape recorder and they start recording it. And they, they say, you know what, Let, maybe we should chart this, you know? And then somebody else had an interest in, you know, charting these things. So they start recording these bleeps and bloops. And they go, and this actually is uh, the recording found at, I think it was Antarctic Station, not necessarily this one. But they start uh, checking these bleeps and bloops, and they go, I'm starting to notice like a little bit of a pattern. There's like a, a variation of the slope, and I think if we use the Doppler effect, we could probably like chart these points. So they do that. So over the next couple weeks and months, they start charting the, the position of Sputnik, and in a few months, they found the trajectory of the satellite going all the way around the planet, right, using this, this technology here. And you know, again, this is not anybody's job description, whatever. This is just a little pet project because they're nerding out and they just love it. And Nothing much comes out of it, and then their boss comes in a couple months later, and he goes, hey, guys, can you just come into my office for a second? They go, yeah, sure. So they sit down, and they go, he goes, I heard you guys were working on that thing for Sputnik. Um, can you, if I got this right, what you managed to do is you managed to track the location of an unknown object from a known location on the ground. They go, yeah, that, that's a pretty good summation of it. He goes, okay, I got a problem, but what I need you to do is, are you able to reverse that? Can you find... A known, an unknown object on the ground from a known object in space. They go, we'll go back to our office, we're gonna run some numbers, see if we we're able to do it. So they go back to the office, and, and of course they, they do it, and they go back to the boss, and say, yeah, you know what, that's actually easier. He goes, great. So I got this contract with the United States military, and they need me to find out how to track our destroyers, so if we launch a missile at Moscow, it's gonna land there, and you know, not somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. So that's how GPS was actually born. So 30 years later, the United States military opened it up to the public, and very much I think everyone in this room actually has a device in their pocket that could communicate with one of these satellites, and you're able to navigate to an unknown destination. So thank you for your time. <laughs>